The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of our podcast series, Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our presenter, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Today, Jim's going to answer the question, what ends crypto's correlation to legacy markets? Bitcoin has been positively correlated to the S&P 500 since August of 2020. In other words, cryptocurrencies and stocks have been intertwined for some time now, Jim. How do institutional investors view cryptos? Uh, the, the answer is that they view it as an extension of what we would refer to as the risk curve. You know, the safest instrument you could buy is a treasury bill, then a treasury security, corporate bonds, high yield bonds, equities, there's probably a few in between. And then when you get all the way at the end of the risk curve, you've got cryptocurrencies, which they view as a lever, like a levered equity position, maybe even a levered non-profitable tech position. So whenever the legacy markets rally, cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum rally a lot more. Whenever they decline, they decline a lot less. And if you look at the chart, as you pointed out, uh, since August of 2020, the correlation has been positive. Now, prior to August of 2020, the correlation vacillated above and below zero, meaning that this is a rolling 13-week correlation, so a rolling three-month, one-quarter correlation. Vacillating above and below zero means there was no really stable relationship. But since August 2020, it's always been positive. And in the last 13 weeks, it's been the highest it's ever been. And what that is, is that is more institutional adoption did start in the summer of 2020, and it continued to grow and grow. And that's why I think we're seeing these correlations go higher and higher. And whenever the legacy markets, if I could use that phrase, get volatile like stocks have, their correlation to cryptos increases. And that's one of the things I was tweeting about this past weekend was the Bitcoin or Ethereum take on the role of being like a a 24 seven volatility measure in the stock market. So over the weekend, I was arguing, look at what the cryptocurrencies were doing on Saturday and Sunday, they were getting killed. And that was probably portending a lot of volatility and a sell-off in legacy markets come this week, which is exactly what happened. And when the legacy markets recovered, the stock market recovered on Monday afternoon in that big turnaround, so did the cryptocurrencies. So they are not leading. They're just an indicator of it. And so when you see in the middle of the night or on a Saturday, the crypto markets move in a big way, you can put that in the back of your mind go, hmm, I bet you then the legacy markets, the stock market itself is going to do something similar. So what breaks the correlation and how does it happen? And I also want to ask the question, if you could answer, what to tell us about TVL, if you could describe that. So starting at the last part first, TVL is a phrase called total locked value. And here's a chart of it. There is in the crypto space, in the decentralized finance space, a bunch of protocols that are either automatic market makers, Uniswap, SushiSwap are the two big ones that are in that space. DYDX is another big one that's in that space. This is where you you go to these protocols, you connect with your electronic wallet like a MetaMask, and you trade currencies. I, I will trade from one crypto to another crypto in that space. Uh, you can also go to a place like Curve or Convex fan, Finance. Um, <clears throat> Ave is another one uh, as well, too. Yearn is, a, is, a, is yet another one. And you can borrow cryptocurrencies, collateralized, of course, not uncollateralized, or you can lend them out and earn interest, which is more coins on them, too. So total TVL is the total amount of cryptocurrencies tied up in smart contracts that are either being in a liquidity pool to allow trading or being lent against or borrow against. Now, the latest numbers, 
two things about the numbers. Let me back up. January of last year, January of 2021, there was $17 billion in TVL. That went to $159 billion by May. Tremendous growth, almost a 10x growth in five months. That number peaked out around $250 billion in the fall, around October, and it's actually a little bit lower now. So the growth rate of TVL has gone practically to zero at this point. In fact, essentially for the last three months, it has been zero. Now, if the cryptocurrency DeFi system is trying to build a new financial system, the size of that financial system it would be this measure called TVL, total, uh, total value locked. Uh, and as it grows, eventually, if this TVL continues to grow to get to a big enough size, I don't know what that number is, if it's a trillion or if it's five trillion or, or whatever that number happens to be, then this new financial system could break free of the legacy system and it won't be considered just the end of the risk curve of the legacy system. It will be a new financial system with its own risk curve. And then the correlations would go away. Can you talk about next to the role of stable coins? Yeah. So the lifeblood of the TVL or of these protocols is a stable coin. And <laughs> that's what makes everything run. Most of the borrowing and lending goes on in stable coins, 70% of the trading. So if I'm going to buy a cryptocurrency in this DeFi space, I'm probably trading with a stable coin like a, a DAI or a Frax or a Tether into an Ethereum. I'm exchanging one for the other. So stable coins are the lifeblood of DeFi. The chart you're looking at now is the total value of stable coins. They didn't exist or essentially didn't exist three years ago. And they were four or $5 billion beginning of last year, now $150 billion. And the green shows you that Tether is uh, the, still the largest and the blue shows you USDC Circle is the second largest. But look at the bottom chart. That shows you the three month growth rate. This three month growth rate of stable coins has really fallen down. It's growing at about a 20% per annum pace over the previous three months, and it has for the last, since about November, that's near the lower end. Of, now that 20% sounds like a big number, except in this space, what that chart shows is it's actually not a big number anymore. It was growing well in excess of 100% per annum <clears throat> on a three month basis until we had the big um, uh, sharp sell-off starting in around uh, the last summer. If you go to the next chart, I want to break the stable coins into two different or two broad categories. The centralized stable coins, the big two there, of course, are Tether and Circle, and they're like 70% of all stable coins. Those are stable coins that are issued by a central authority. They have a trust in a regulated financial institution that's supposed to back the stable coin issuance. That is, the green line is Tether, the percentage of all stable coins made up by Tether. It has fallen to exactly 50%. <clears throat> the blue line on that chart is USDC Circle. That has been rising. But if you take those two together, almost one for one, they've got almost no growth. What's happening is Circle is rising by taking market share away from Tether. The bottom chart in black, that's the algorithmic and the crypto backed stable coin. So Maker. MakerDAO's DAI stablecoin, which, which was the original one, it's not backed by dollars in a bank account. It's backed by a smart contract that holds Ethereum and a whole bunch of other uh, cryptocurrencies in proportion that the value of all those cryptocurrencies is equal to the value of the DAI's outstanding, assuming DAI is $1. An algorithmic stablecoin has no backing. Well, what happens is, automatically they come in and they, they they act kind of like an ETF manager to manage the NAV on an ETF. When it gets too high, they sell it. When it gets too low, they buy it to try and keep bringing it back to $1 uh, on it. And the algorithmic stable coins don't have a good history right now. Um, they've blown up, they've gone to zero, they've been poorly constructed. That's been a lot of their history. But lately there's been some new ones like Frax, which is actually 
a fractional algorithmic stablecoin. It has some backing. Um, and Fay is another one. Um, Terra USD is a third one. And what happened is, is that you can see their growth rates kind of peaked in November, right around the same time that you start to see the growth rates of overall stable coins fall. Now, why is this important? I'm going to jump ahead here uh, to the last day, to the last chart. And, uh, um, you know, if you look at the last chart, the orange line is the TVL and the blue line is the amount of stable coins outstanding. And the bottom chart is a ratio of the two. And it looks like you cannot get this ratio above two, which means for every dollar of stable coins outstanding, you can have about $2 of total locked value in these protocols, either being borrowed against, lent against, put into a liquidity pool. So how does, getting back to the original question, how does cryptocurrency break its correlation with traditional markets? The TVL grows to some huge number. Uh, and then it becomes its own financial system with its own risk curve. How do you get the TVL to some huge number? Double or triple or quadruple the amount of stable coins outstanding, maybe even more. How's that going to happen? Well, there's two ways you can do that. You can have the centralized stable coins, Tether, USDC, Circle, double, triple, quadruple. The problem there is they're highly regulated. In the case of USDC Circle, they're playing really nice with the regulators. Regulators are not going to allow that. They're afraid of stable coins. They think st all stable coins are a run waiting to happen, meaning, yeah, these kids are playing around in this toy, in this little sandbox called DeFi and cryptocurrencies, and they're taking these dollar tokens called stable coins and they're playing back and forth with each other. But one day they're going to wake up and realize all this stuff is worthless and they're all going to run back to circle and tether and go, here's my stable coin. Give me one dollar because I want out. And if they grow to a trillion dollars or a trillion and a half dollars in size and everybody wants out and they have to sell a trillion and a half dollars worth of securities to raise the money to pay off these stable coins, they'll crash the traditional markets. So I don't think regulators are going to allow those centralized coins to double, triple, quadruple, even if they're backed, because they're more afraid there's going to be a run than they are um, not. It's up to the crypto back, the algorithmic back stable coins to double, triple, go up 5x in value, 10x in value. They're decentralized. No one can control them. Um, they've got a checkered history, but what seems to be coming out of this decline in the in cryptos, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum are down more than 50% from their peak. It's what you're not hearing. You're not hearing any stories, at least not yet, uh, and hopefully never, that protocols are failing, that stable coins are losing their peg, especially the algorithmic stable coins, meaning they don't trade one dollar at all the time. They trade a dollar ten, dollar twenty, or 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents, and does it start whipping around all over the place? Uh, so they're not stable coins then at that point. That's not happening. It's not happening that some of the borrowing protocols or the lending protocols are stressed. Sure, people in those protocols are being liquidated. There's a famous story now about a $600 million liquidated uh, position in the MakerDAO vaults, call, and then the name of the account was called Seven Siblings. Uh, and, but it came off without a hitch. MakerDAO is not in trouble. It is not failing. It doesn't need the equivalent of a bailout. So as this stress point continues and these stable coins hold their value, these DeFi protocols hold their value, there is no risk. They're not fragile. They turn out to be anti-fragile. Coming out of this, there might be more confidence in algorithmic and in crypto backed stable coins, they would see mass adoption grow 2x, 3x, 5x. TVL can grow 2x, 3x, 5x. And then one day we wake up and go, there's a trillion dollars plus in TVL or $2 trillion in TVL. This is its own financial system. This is not the extension of the legacy system. Then it decouples, it becomes its own little world. And then we could start talking about whether or not a new financial system was born. We're not there yet. We're still 
seeing cryptos being tied to the legacy system because of the way that all the institutions view it. But that's how you break this correlation. Now, maybe that takes a year or maybe that takes 10 years, but we'll have to see whether or not we can get this stable coin adoption because as this ratio shows, you cannot really grow these things much beyond this without more stable coin adoption. But maybe this is what these bear markets do for the crypto space is we stress them and we stress them hard, meaning prices get extraordinarily volatile. And then what happens? Nothing. No one blows up. No one needs a bailout. No one depegs. Um, you know, people lose money and they get all they get all sad and they get all mad. But that's basically all that happens. And then coming out of it, we we have a, a new confidence that maybe the prices go up or down. Sure. But the DeFi protocols themselves and the whole idea of what a stablecoin represents, that gets more confidence. So maybe I'm more willing to play this space by holding stablecoins because when the next bear market comes, I don't have to run back to my Citibank account. I could just sit there with stablecoins, not worrying that oh, I'm going to wake up one day, my stablecoin's worth 60 cents. It'll always be worth a dollar. And if you get that, you'll get mass adoption, mass growth. And then I think the correlations would break. So, Jim, to summarize for our last point, though, what happens after it's broken? <clears throat> what happens after it's broken is an interesting point because at that point, it becomes its own financial system with its own set of rules and its own set of ways of doing stuff. It becomes a competitor to the current financial system. Then you know, protocols or anybody wants to raise money, anybody that's looking for investments, now you've got a whole nother set of choices to pick from than you have right now. You have a whole nother set of competition to pick from than you have right now. And then that could really start to change the world of finance. Who's going to pick this? Who's going to use this? There's two fancy words we like to use. You've heard a lot, metaverse and Web3. And it's true. We talk about these words all the time and we don't really know what they are yet. But let me conceptually tell you where I think we're going with this. Web3 means decentralized internet. Right now, we have Web2. Web1 was like email in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, so we're now in Web2, which is referred to as the platforms, the Facebooks, the Googles, the YouTubes, the Twitters. Uh, as well. They're all centralized. We know that because they deflatform people, they demonetize people, they they suspend accounts or cancel accounts um, all the time. There's a lot of control in that system. In the decentralized world, which would be run by the blockchain, it's not going to be controlled by anybody. And the metaverse would probably be some hybrid of gaming, work from home, video, Zoom, all put together in some kind of a seamless package that we would use. As I've you know, jokingly told a lot of my friends, you know, if you've got a teenager who spends all day at home gaming, you know, they're the cutting edge of the future is what they are. They're in the, that's where the future's going, is how gamers relate, how gamers work, how our work from home in several years down the road might more as resemble a game, uh, a video game, in then than it does right now when we use Zoom and spreadsheets and, our, and, and email and everything more um, uh, in, interconnected. That system, think about the FANG stocks and throw in NVIDIA and Microsoft and some others. There's like $11 trillion of market cap there. That whole new metaverse through Web3 system is going to have its own financial system. That's decentralized finance is what this is. So that's what that's its use case. And once it gets there, Companies will redefine themselves in the Web3 and the metaverse. Look, Facebook's already changed its name to Meta. Uh, Twitter's, um, uh, I'm sorry, Square is already going to change their name to Block uh, as well. Microsoft just spent $70 billion to buy uh, Activision Blizzard because they're going to move into this space. Well, where is Facebook? Where is Microsoft? Where is Square going to go for their financing and go for their investment banking? They're going to go to DeFi. And then all of a sudden, Walmart's starting to get into NFTs uh, as well, too. So's the NBA. So's the NFL supposed to be uh, unveiling its own NFT program. Where are they going to get the financing for this? 
they're going to go maybe to DeFi. Then the traditional JP Morgans and Goldman Sachs are going to find they've got a whole new set of competitors on a whole different playing field. And then that's when we wind up seeing a whole new way of doing finance. So it is exciting. I think that that's where we're going with this. I don't know if it's going to be two years or 20. Uh, it depends on how many setbacks we have along the way. But you could start to see this thing making taking shape, which is why I've fallen down the crypto rabbit hole the last couple of years and become such a big fan of it. Well, Jim, thank you for your thoughts today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information or any questions, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.